Welcome to Bigfoot and the Bunny. This is a couple's journey into the mysterious, the unknown, and, and the, the paranormal. paranormal. I'm your host, Chris Carr. And I'm your host, Kristen Johnson. Together, Together we, we are, are Bigfoot, Bigfoot and, and the, the Bunny. bunny. And we're live. Welcome to Bigfoot and the Bunny. I'm your host, Chris Carr. And I am Kristen Johnson. And we have cats in the room, so if you see something moving, it's Shut probably up. not a shadow person, but a black cat named Poe. He is by my feet right now. Uh, happy Saturday, guys. Happy Saturday. I hope you're doing good. Kristen's computer is basically on fire, yeah. so <laughs> her chat moderation may not be so hot tonight, but we'll do our best yeah. to uh, get to that stuff. What do you want to say? I uh, wanted to say, uh, give a shout out to our good friend, Greg Koss, mm -hmm. uh, who had a season finale of uh, the Shadow Hour last night. And uh, we posted that. If you're not familiar with uh, Shadow Hunters Paranormal, uh, we give him a plug because we we like him a lot. And we're on uh, his other show, Metaphysical Correct. Crossings, um, pretty often on a rotation with some other other folks and with some really great people. Um, we put those on our, our Facebook pages. Um Facebook.com slash Bigfoot and the Bunny and Dark Horse Paranormal Productions. So do check those out. You know, you can see them there and it'll link you right back to his page. And uh, he had Natalie Jones on mm -hmm. uh, last night. It was a finale. I guess it's taking like a month off. He's doing some travel and some stuff. And um, family stuff. Too. Yeah. Natalie is part of the Dominion Ministries, uh, which we're also part of. And uh, we're getting to know some of the people. It's kind of big network of paranormal investigators, researchers, case managers, all kinds of cool mm -hmm. folks, Stories. psychics and yeah, all kinds yeah. of things going on there. It's kind of like an international network. It's kind of like IHOP for the paranormal, <laughs> International House of Paranormal. Oh, I like that. Anyway, there we go. Is that a thing yet? That's a thing. All right. Don't, nobody take that's ours. <laughs> yeah, you can't steal that. We're going to copyright that's it. it. And I uh, see uh, Debbie Wallace Hagen out there. Hello, Debbie. How Hi, you doing? Debbie. Happy Saturday. Well, we're getting right to things, I yes. guess. Uh, we have a great guest for you guys this week. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about her. Her name is Heather Lee Landon, and uh, she's been on here before. Uh, she's a host of uh, Ghost Ed uh, for our pun people and pun family, uh, Ghost Ed 101. Uh, she started her journey in a paranormal field more than 30 years ago as a teenager and after multiple interactions with her grandfather who had passed away many years prior. Throughout the years following, she has researched and traveled to locations in order to learn more about the history and paranormal claims. Uh, she holds, holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Metaphysical Human Science, specializing in paranormal science. She is a certified paranormal investigator, CPI, and certified EVP technician. And we love EVPs on here. Yes, we do. Yes, we like to throw some theories around that. About, around that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um her goal is to help others take a more scientific approach to their paranormal investigations and research. So it sounds like she takes the woo out of things. Ooh. Uh, she they, She's part of some other foundations. Uh, she also hosts the Warren Files, uh, which is great, with Chris McKinnell um, talking about the Warren cases and such. Let's bring her on. We'll talk about it. Hey there, Heather. Hey, Heather. Welcome Hello. back. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, I, I just, if I abbreviated a few things, I figured we could talk about it on here with you. That's fine. My bio is long and I let you guys or whoever is hosting the show figure out what they want to share. <laughs> yeah, I know we have that feeling too, you know, with the guests, it's like we could say, you know, send us a short bio and they send us like 14 pages. Like, well, okay, we'll just do this part. And then when yeah, we go on we somebody go else's on, show, right. it's the same thing. We do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. I go, wow, this is way too long. Who's going to read us? <laughs> <laughs> but there's some very cool stuff in there. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I think a lot of us know that you uh, uh, co-host uh, the uh, Ghost Education 101 with Philip Wyatt, who was on last week, and we love Philip, and uh, as well as the Warren Files with yes. Chris. So th yeah. that is great stuff, and um, I, I like that you're into EVPs. I'm sorry, we got some cats and wires. Are an interesting mix of things. Yes. Going on under the table over here. Uh, Irene Takura says, hi, everyone. Hey, Irene. Haven't hi, seen Irene. you in a while. From yes. Tokyo, Japan. So, yeah, I love that. Love the, the pun and being international here. We're talking to the world, Heather. So, <laughs> That's uh, always a good thing, though. <laughs> it, it certainly is. And um, I, I know we talked about this a little bit before when you were on the show, but how did you get your start in the paranormal? And notice mention of your, your grandfather. 
as a right. child. Right. I started seeing visions of my grandfather when I was a teenager, um, 16, 17. He would appear at the foot of my bed, sitting next to my bed, walking the hallway. And what kind of it piqued my interest is back then, the person had to have had some type of connection to the property or they had, you know, the belief was they had to die there in order to haunt the location. And this was a house that he had never been to. We purchased after he had passed, many years after he passed. So it was kind of just odd for him to be there. So that kind of piqued my interest and I started going to the library and researching as much as I could about the field. Excellent. Yeah, and that was back when we had to go to the library and yes. use the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> exactly. I can't even finish entire words. Yeah. This gets me. He's like, I have kids. We have we kids. We have kids that and, uh, abbreviate yeah. everything. Everything adorbs, is an sus. abbreviation. So it's like, wow. <laughs> they skip right over that whole, let's go to the draws and it's a different day use day. the Dewey Decimal System <laughs> to look stuff up. We had limited information back then <laughs> as well. Exactly. Right. So I, I relied a lot of it when we would take vacations. I would uh, take the haunted tours that they would have or, you know, try to find um, when I went to Gettysburg a lot. There was Mark Nesbitt did a lot of book signings and lectures, and I was at every single one of them whenever we were in town. Oh, that's really cool. cool. <laughs> nice. So were you into people like Hans Holzer as well, like growing up and reading? Yep. All of those. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Nancy Drew? No. Not really. I had Hardy Boys. I, I, yeah, not, I had Hardy Boys. I'm not too proud to. <laughs> I was gonna say I like the Hardy Boys growing up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. That's awesome. I also had Encyclopedia Brown, but that's a whole other thing. Trying to debunk his cases. <laughs> Scooby Doo. So no. Scooby Doo. Yes. Yeah, Scooby Doo is the classics. So you're a certified EVP technician. What what does that entail? And what do you think about what EVPs are and how they come about? Um, to, for that class, it was through the Institute of Metaphysical and Humanistic Science, where I got my PhD from. It was a series of courses that they offered, and if you completed them you and passed the test at the end, which was difficult, because you had to hear what the instructors thought they heard. <laughs> oh. you, know, you know how with EVPs, we all hear something different sometimes? Yeah, so absolutely. It's, you know, trying to determine what, you know, what was either really said in the EVPs, and once you finished that, they gave you, you know, from that particular institution, their certification. And it went through everything. We learned how to analyze EVPs. We learned um, how to play around like an audacity with the different feature settings, how to enhance, how to play backwards and, you know, all of that stuff and all the different, more or less, it ended up with an outline on if you think you hear an EVP, here's what you need to go through mm -hmm. to determine if it really is an EVP. Mm -hmm. That's cool. That's cool. Yep. What are some of the things that, that you do to determine whether you know it's somebody's belly growling and they want ihop or somebody whispered in the background another famous that's always the hardest part and you have to rely on your fellow investigators to mark it if their stomach growls and you know be honest <laughs> right because <laughs> there's an evp we have that i swear sounds like what a pterodactyl would sound like and we were in a dinosaur exhibit when we were doing the investigation oh wow um, oh wow and nobody said anything and everyone's like no my stomach didn't growl and the digital voice recorder was at least 10 feet away from the nearest investigator so you have to look at all the different factors like you know that's why i always make a map when you're investigating of exactly where all the equipment is and where everybody was standing mm -hmm. you make sure everybody marks whenever they move talk make any type of bodily function noise or whatever ends up happening <laughs> while they're there and then from there you can kind of figure out if what you have is an EVP. And it's easier to determine the EVPs if you don't have the noise of the spirit boxes going off in the background. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Right. That does, you know, contribute to everything else with all mm -hmm. those, that noise. It's ridiculous sometimes. Yes, we understand <laughs> that. I like what you said about, you know, people trying to decide what is said. We have an example of that we play sometimes, and it, I guess now is a good, good time. Uh, it's a sound clip that was came from a spirit box. And depending how if I tell you what it said, you'll probably hear it. And it's that kind of audio apophenia, I think is the word, right? Where you yes. start to get paranoia about it. I'll tell you both things and we'll just play it real quick. Um, it either says Frank, Mike, Christopher, or it says bring light Lucifer. And that, that's two very diverse things right? <laughs> <laughs> or meanings. So let me play that. Mm -hmm. 
that's one of those things. I don't know how clearly that comes through the stream, but I, I love that example as a, as a way of saying, you know, you, this could be different things to different people. That's right. like the Yanni and Laurel. Right. The Yanni yeah. Laurel thing. Yes. You know, your ears can be tuned different ways. Females have ears that are tuned differently than mm -hmm. males, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So you may hear something differently because you're going to hear a different range of frequencies, slightly yeah. different. Yeah. And that's also why when you want to have other investigators listen to what you're listening to, don't tell them what you think you hear. Cause yeah. Right. Go blind. Right. Just say, right. what does it sound like? Yeah. You know, yeah. It, the, as we as investigators, I think we have a tendency to put a lot of context into stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. And Irene says, uh, bring light to Lucifer. Is that what you heard? Right. So bring light Lucifer or Frank Michael Christopher. Frank yeah. Mike. See, and I heard the Frank Michael Christopher. <laughs> right. Right. See, so it's <laughs> easy. It's easy. Irene also mentioned she said it's really hard being the only person who's into the paranormal and alone here. Uh, being in Japan and Tokyo, no one wants to be part of a family of paranormal friends. And it's more shunned than welcome these days. Well, we're glad you're part of this family. Yes, Irene. thank you, Irene. And uh, we always love your presence on mm -hmm. our shows. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let me see. So we, I, we definitely want to get into the, the new book. And the last mm -hmm. time you were on, I think you were in the process of writing this book. Uh, it looks to be awesome. I think it's part of the Haunted America series. Mm -hmm. And it's Haunted Southern Nevada Ghost Towns. Yeah, I actually just got my copies in. Oh, really? Oh, nice. Congratulations. <laughs> I, I was so excited. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. I bet. I know this has been a, in the works for a while. Uh, do you want to tell us about it and some of the interesting places you visited? Uh, yeah, what well, got me interested in, I've always been a writer, and that's, I've always wanted to be an author. So it kind of fell into place after my family and I were asked to film Real Hunts Ghost Towns with motion picture video. It's a documentary about the different ghost towns in Southern Nevada. And we had done so much research on it. So it was almost like the book was already written between, you know, just had to be pieced together because we, you know, investigated Goldfield, Gold Point, Nelson, and the way they wanted to do this documentary is they wanted to look more at the history mm -hmm. and how the history could fuel the paranormal activity. So it was more of a history documentary with a touch of paranormal attached to it. So and then I reached out to um, History Press, which is part of Acadia Publishing, and said, you know, hey, here's the book idea I have. They loved it. They told me to run with it, and I signed the contract just days after I pitched it to them, and it just all kind of fell into place. It also includes um, several photos that I've taken at the different ghost towns. Um, it also includes stories from other paranormal investigators that I've talked to, as well as um, it has several. I try to make it as interesting as possible, so it will be, still be entertaining. So it has a lot of narrative stories about some of the personal experiences I've had, including the experience I had when I went into a collapsed mine to do an investigation. Wow. Now, that's really interesting. You think about the concept of, of mining. You're basically going around what? Like things like like quartz and gold and metals and gems and mm -hmm. crystals are going to be in this mine. Do you think that contributes to the phenomena? It, it does. And there's a concept. It's not in this book, but it's going to be in another book that I'm doing um, coming up soon um, about it's similar. You guys probably have Bermuda Triangle, Alaska Triangle. Mm -hmm. There's also a Nevada Triangle where okay. it spans and it covers um, Searchlight, which is just south of Vegas, um, out to Area 51, Goldfield, um, heads up to Reno and then back down. And oh, that's wow. where the highest concentration of gold deposits, you know, all the different crystal quartz and everything like that. And that's where tons of planes have crashed for no reason. I know um, Carol Lombard's plane, which is discussed in this book, um, crashed just uh, just off of Potosi Mountain. Okay. So Clark Gable spent his days waiting to hear about the search party at the Good Springs Saloon. And they're both reported to haunt that saloon. And it's just, there's a lot of a lot of things they're contributing to the activity in, in addition to you know could it be alien right, right. of course it could because you have area 51 yeah. and then you know the nevada triangle just like the bermuda triangle they feel it's alien related and you get these areas where you have just multiple phenomena now we live inside and just outside of the bridgewater triangle 
mm-hmm. which a lot of people talk about as well. And it's this sort of portal thing where you've got, you know, UFOs, you've got Bigfoot, you've got a lot of ghosts, you've got yeah. unusual events occurring, yeah. phantom hitchhikers and the like. So exactly. that, that sounds a lot like uh, the Nevada Triangle. Mm-hmm. And they do attribute this to the, the ground, the mineral content and, and whatnot of the metals and everything. That makes a lot of sense mm-hmm. because of all that mining and the gold expansion, which is a, a pretty interesting history in itself, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Western expansion. You know. It's amazing how fast everything boomed and then how quickly everything died, especially when World War One hit. Because mm-hmm. they shut everything down to focus on, you know, manufacturing stuff for the war instead of mining wasn't a priority at the time. So a lot of people, that was the beginning of the end for a lot of these towns. Wow. I, I never really thought about that. No. Is that that is what brought about the ghost towns, as it were? Mm-hmm. Wow, interesting. Wow. Uh, tell us about the mine and what that experience was like. Uh, well, we were invited up to investigate a mine, um, Florence Mine. It's owned by John Arick and his family, and we were filming a documentary, or not a documentary, um, a TV pilot with a production crew that does a lot of work with A and E and Discovery and all of that. And unfortunately, that got shelved because of COVID. Because we filmed the February before COVID really hit. And um, when we were up there, we investigated the mine, how um, the collapse mine. And while we were in there, um, best place to ever use a spirit box because it's 100% white noise and there's no contamination from radio waves in the, you know, when you go to the bottom of a mine, <laughs> there, there's no content. So if you get any voices on that thing, it's 100% legit because yeah. there's nothing there. Right. Wow. Almost like being in a Faraday cage or something. Yeah, right? exactly. How so, deep are the mines? Um, the one we went place? into was maybe, it wasn't that deep. It was more like we went in on just a slow angle. So just a couple hundred feet. Mm-hmm. But then I've been in a couple others that were several stories deep wow. and everything like that. But this one we were in particular was a collapsed one. So it was, you went in the entrance, um, maybe the half of a length of a football field. We went back, but it might've only dropped a hundred feet at that point, but the whole back area collapsed. And I went back all the way to that area where all the rubble was. And while back there, I completely lost all sense of where I was, couldn't breathe. Um, I heard screaming. I felt like I was being crushed. I started crying and it was just awful. It was the worst experience I've ever had on an investigation. But once they got me out of there, I was maybe five feet away. I was perfectly fine. Oh, wow. That's definitely trauma right there. Yeah, uh, visual. yeah for sure. Yeah. It, what kind of things uh, were you getting on the spirit box or EVPs? EVPs. Down there, we weren't getting anything. But the other thing with Goldfield is that it's also in the middle of nowhere and there's only one radio station. So you could still use the spirit box and, you know, you barely pick anything up anyway. And we were getting uh, men's voices talking. You couldn't really make out what they were saying, almost like they were mumbling and going on about their day. Interesting. You know? yeah. yeah. But we were also hearing the same voices with our, you know, naked ears. Sure. So oh, okay. there. Wow. That, that's that's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just yeah. lives there. What what were some of the other interesting places that you visited and, and why do you think they were haunted? Um, we did Gold Point and Gold Point was haunted, um, we firmly believe, because there we did our investigation near the hangman's noose. And um, in Gold Point, there's absolutely no radio frequencies whatsoever that we picked up at all. So we knew on that because with that one, because we were filming for the documentary, we did use a spirit box because it's really hard to use in digital voice recorder when you're trying to do something for a TV show. <laughs> so the spirit box was our only way of, you know, showing what what was happening. And sure. the minute we turned it on, it was like everyone was like, who people? Let's go talk to them. We got hello, hello, hello. Hi, hello. Just all over the place. And it was just weird because it was at the Hangman's News. But that was where people hung out, was in the downtown area. Sure. And it just happened to be, you know, it was their, enter- I don't want to say it was their entertainment, but it basically was. I think it probably was, right? Yeah. yeah. That's not like they had the internet. <laughs> yeah, it, it was their social gathering point. It was just really interesting. And then when we were in Nelson, which was El Dorado Canyon Mines, we went to an abandoned mine that was just north of the town Nelson south of the town of Nelson. And we, it was pretty deep and they even warned us going in because we had to have, we didn't bring the tour guide in with us, but they did tell us don't go past this point because it drops into nothing. 
So it was like there were bottomless pits throughout there. And when we went down there, we could see shadows and we were all sitting still and there was nobody outside. You know, you can see shadows down the tunnels. There was, you know, footsteps, popping noises, a whole bunch of interesting things That's happening creepy. down there. <laughs> That's definitely creepy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of shadows, what are your thoughts on shadow people, right? This is a controversial topic or multifaceted, we'll say, in the paranormal. Yeah, that one is still, it needs a lot of research on it because I personally feel that shadow people are not so much shadow people, but not everybody can see, you know, full, full-bodied full apparitions or we can't see them all the time. So it's a combination of things. It's We're not on the same frequency as that particular spirit is. So we see them in the form of a shadow or they just don't have enough energy to manifest. So they do what they can and manifest in the best form they can. Interesting. So do you think that they're really in a different dimension in us and trying to cross over and not fully able to do so? And therefore we see this sort of projection of them that comes across as a shadow. I I think that's also another possibility because one theory I have is that we're on all multiple planes and all parallel universes and except for the planes aren't exactly straight they almost like work like wave frequencies and as our waves with ours meet up with the other dimension that's when we can see the paranormal activity and then it diminishes as we go past so maybe we're seeing the shadow figures when we're not close together and i know um, other theories are that the shadow figures are actually alien in nature and jumping Mm -hmm. through portals from one universe to another. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Of course we've heard all these sort of things, but Mm -hmm. we don't really know. And it seems like it might be even situational. You know, sometimes it's like a ghost or an apparition and sometimes it's something even more nefarious Mm -hmm. or nefarious. (laughs) Yes. That is, you know, uh, maybe not so kind of nature. We'll say, I mean, a lot of people have, uh, you know, shadow figure hauntings and uh, childhood experiences and that sort of thing. Like Kristen, over here, yeah. <laughs> who saw them as a child. It was and, terrible. And was terrified of them. They were very yeah. negative. I, I but, know there's uh, one shadow apparition that I used to see frequently. I don't see them anymore ever since we left Vegas. But we would investigate a local location. And it was our team, basically where our team held our monthly meetings. And we would do a practice investigation. The place would let us, you know, stay after our meeting and do an investigation. And I kept seeing this, I mean, big guy, you know, it almost reminded me of what you would expect Lenny from Of Mice and Men to look like, you know, just okay. just, just big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he was always, you know, just watching from the corner, you know, and lingering. And COVID hit, or well, first before COVID hit, um, he did come and visit me after one of our investigations there. Um, I woke up to him standing at the foot of my bed. And prior to that, I had had a dream of him telling us never to come back to the location again. It was dangerous. Uh. But that didn't stop us. We went back and we went back several times. Then COVID hit and he would just appear in my kitchen and be like, you know, almost it almost felt like a, hey, are you okay? (laughs) (laughs) That's interesting. (laughs) Yeah. I haven't seen you in a while. Are you okay? So it was kind of, but I haven't seen him since we've moved. Wow. So I, I like the analogy with Lenny. I, I like that book. And yeah. I recall he was a big oafish kind of guy. It was a long yeah. time ago. That I, Just looking out right. for you. Yeah. yeah that, and that's what you reminded me of. That was like, even when I saw him, that's what I thought of was the book. <laughs> Interesting. That would be the, the feeling, too, you would get from it. Yeah. You know, what uh, role do you think um, a psychic impressions play in a paranormal investigation? I think it's big, major. I mean, because even with EVPs, there's um, tests going on and theories that the EVPs are actually not voices of ghosts or spirits. They're actually our thoughts of what we think the answer should be. Mm, like Which I was, is where okay. the Estes method and all of those come into play because you're not hearing the question being asked. So you don't know what the answer is. But like, let's say, you know, we're in a group doing an investigation and my fellow investigator says, you know, hey, what's your name? And all of a sudden we get, you know, Sally on the recorder, is it really a Sally or was someone in the group thinking the name Sally at the time and their thoughts imprinted on the voice recorder? Oh, I like that. Interesting. Yes. yes. Very, and, you know, that like plays that. into other things, too, like remote viewing in the subconscious. Mm-hmm. Right? That our subconscious may know everything and know all the answers, right. you know, right. so if it can hear it or someone's can, and maybe it, it, that's what's putting it out there. And it's not this uh, discarnate spirit. 
And, and there's also theories on that a lot of the spirits that we encounter are just self manifestations. They're, they're mm-hmm. not really, you know, ghosts of our, you know, deceased loved ones. That's we want them there so badly that we've manifested them to be near. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's certainly a possibility. It's one I, I really, because I know it's like a personal choice, I don't want to believe in that. Right. But it's certainly within the realm of, of possibility. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, certainly uh, there were poltergeist cases that were documented by parapsychologists that about, you know, involved like teenage girls in particular mm-hmm. and their hormones and, and they were creating this phenomena, psychokinesis in the house and things are flying around and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. It seemed to be attributed to one person. And then there are cases where it's not. Right. So yep. It's hard to, to say exactly what is going on. Which is and kind and of that's why we need to have more people in this field who are dedicated to researching the why Mm-hmm. Well, why and the how, not just does it happen, but right. why does it happen? And we're never going to get there if we don't, I, I, if we don't bond together, you know, get together and come up with some set of way of doing this. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's too many, I, I'm all for going to that haunted location and learning about the history and, you know, doing an investigation because it's practice. But if that's all you do, this field is never going to grow. Yeah, right. we, we, we'd agree. We, we're about the, we the hows and the whys. The hows and whys, no, the hows and highs. The wows and the highs, Kristen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about this. The wow. I know, I was not drinking. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just a slip, but it yeah. was kind of funny. And uh, we agree with you. We say that a lot. The mm-hmm. hows and the whys. Like, why, why do these things occur? And you know, we don't feel like um, the field knows all the answers. You know, there's just a lot of theories and uh, hypotheses being mm-hmm. thrown around. Uh, we need better ways of testing it out to yes. get to the, the truth, you know. Um, so yeah, and, and we've gone far beyond proving paranormal activity occurs. We, we know it occurs. There, there's no doubt about it. So why are we still trying to prove that it, it exists? Right, right. We agree sure. With you. We have a question out there from Lorianne Sweet. Hello, Lorianne. How are you Hello. doing today? She asks, uh, do you think any shadow people are sometimes human created by negativity and a repeated buildup of negative actions? It could be. Or other figures, actually. Yep. It was and that, that could be the reason why they're a shadow is because they're all the negatives of what we think and what we manifest. Yeah. Sorry, like, okay. Sorry. So that it creates almost a residual type thing that can it can take on a life of its own. I think we're getting into yep. the land of uh, yeah, Carl Jung and the mm-hmm. idea of, you know, a collective um, consciousness or unconsciousness out there, however you want to put it. And um, the idea of like an egregore. And your thought could create a, a thing that could maybe live on its own. Yeah, it, it's and, and actually it just reminded me of another theory that's out there, too, is that, you know, does paranormal activity wear away over time? Good yes. question. So is it one of those things where, you know, are they, we seeing them as a shadow figure because they're an entity from the caveman age? Mm-hmm. And they're just worn away so much that that's all we see. Right. And perhaps legends keep things alive. Like uh, you could take Lizzie Borden, you know, as an example or something like the Conjuring House that's out here. And people are just have such a belief in it. You know, Lizzie Borden, that, that was a long time ago. You know, people still uh, congregate there mm-hmm. and, you know, think they see members of her family or talk to them often. Mm-hmm. And yeah, is it yeah. the belief systems of the people? You know, if in 200 years, will they still be talking about Lizzie Borden and will will it still be haunted? That's a good question. Right. Yeah. And like with Gettysburg, we have all the reenactments that occur there. Are the reenactments what's keeping the activity happening? Sure. Sure. Fueling it in some way. Yes. You know? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's, that's a great theory. Um, I like thinking about things like that. And in these uh, the ghost towns, what, what do you think might be keeping those alive? Well, when the ghost towns were um, most active in the heyday and when they were, you know, booming, they, it was the place to be. It was, you know, they would have social gatherings. They would have parties uh, like the Goldfield Hotel, you know, was this luxurious, you know, the luxurious of the luxurious. And the Goldfield High School, they actually were the only public high school in the state of Nevada at the time to have a full-size basketball court besides the University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, UNLV. Okay. So they're only the school of its size to actually have an indoor basketball court that was full-size and not just partial. So they, these towns had the money and they were able to do the, you know, the best of the best. And in addition to, they were comfortable there. That was where they were their happiest 
you know, before their lives was torn up, lives were torn apart, but forced to move. And then you also had the um, Wild West mentality. Everybody there, these towns became very lawless. Like Nelson, the sheriff was two hours away and he didn't come unless there was a dead body. And half the time he didn't even come for that. Oh my goodness. So, so they wow. could do their own thing. And yep, pretty much that right. leaves a lot of residual energy behind that, you I know, feels like are- normal. Um, everything from happy to sad to, you know, just they, they made a major imprint, you know, like there's talk of um, Virgil Earp settled in at Goldfield and why it would come visit him a lot. And there's, Reports of people seeing at least Virgil because he had died in Goldfield and he loved it there. He was the sheriff. He lived his final days there. He was so happy being there. They would see, you know, with the hat and the big mustache that he had um, walking down the street to this day. Oh, that's really cool. And I wanted to to ask you that if uh, there were any of those sort of tombstone-esque characters like Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp, yep. you know, were there, are there legends of seeing them and that sort of thing in these towns? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, no one's really reported seeing Wyatt, but they have reported seeing uh, Virgil, and it's really it's really interesting the stories that you hear from the town's people. Sure, sure, it had to be an exciting time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and why wouldn't you want to stay? You know, spend your afterlife where you were once happy. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, yeah, that is interesting. Uh, Gail Heisen, hello, Gail says hello. Hi, guys, cooking and listening. Hugs. Hi, uh, Gail. Hugs back, Gail. We Hi, miss you. How are you doing? We miss you. Got to catch up soon. And uh, she's a friend of ours in the show as well. And she has a, a great show of her own called uh, Small, Small Medium at large. large. So do check that out, folks. Uh, these ghost towns, I, I just, I, how far out do they go? Do they go all the way through to like California? Did they kind of stop in Nevada? They're all over the place from what I've discovered. I mean, you have all of Nevada, you have Arizona. Um, New Mexico Mm -hmm. has a ton of them. California Calico is one of the most uh, famous haunted ghost towns. And um, the Haunted America series book, I believe it's Brian Clune. He wrote Haunted Calico as part of the series, and that's a really good book. And then the one thing I found interesting, and that's, I want to say it's third or fourth in my queue of books that I'm working on right now for uh, History Press, is Haunted Florida Ghost Towns. Oh, because okay. Florida okay. has over 250 ghost towns. Oh, and, okay. and I didn't realize that until one day I stumbled upon it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. I know Florida has a lot of like old history because mm-hmm. of Columbus and that sort of thing. Yep. And people coming in there and invading. And, and I see your computers. Just yeah, thank you so much, because there's so many comments right now. <laughs> We've got Doug in there. I'm sorry. Rob yes, folks. I, Kristen's having trouble moderating because their computer is basically on fire. We missed us talking about that earlier. Yeah. Uh, we will try to get to everyone's comments. <laughs> Sorry, Heather. But uh, okay. yeah, super interesting. Like Florida has all sorts of things. And ghost towns are, are a subject that I'm just not, like, I don't know a lot about. You know, mm-hmm. I find them interesting and fascinating, but I don't know where, exactly where all they, where they are. And I'm very interested in your, your book uh, coming out so I can learn a little bit more about it. And just to reiterate the name, it's going to be called Haunted Southern Nevada Ghost Towns, part of the Haunted America series. And uh, you can pre-order that now on Amazon. Uh, it's due out August 22nd. Yeah. So pretty yeah. soon. And what I did, I mean, and Chris McKinnell wrote the foreword. Oh. So, and he doesn't do that often. <laughs> so I, I, I'm real lucky that he did that. But the first two chapters in the book, real quick, just they talk about what makes a ghost town and then why are ghost towns haunted before it dives deep into the different do- towns throughout Nevada. Great. Well, that, that sounds like uh, really good information and something we, we want to sign up for and learn more about. I mean, we love American history and we, we feel like what we're taught growing up is it's just so incorrect. You know, right. we, we've done a lot of research into like native American history and the indigenous people of America and uh, the stuff they, you know, especially in our time that, you know, um, schools taught us about Thanksgiving and stuff is just yes. so far from the yeah. truth. It, it's not even funny. It's actually extremely sad, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as well as other cultures. Uh, Quaker uh, culture has been mm-hmm. interesting to us because of a, a particular cemetery we like that happens to be part of the Society of Friends, which is the Quakers. And uh, their history uh, is very interesting. They were persecuted much like witches were. Mm-hmm. Here in, uh, by the Mass Bay colonies, 
and stuff like that. We love the history aspect too. Besides those hows and whys, like uh, throw us some good history, and we're we're all over it. You know, the true story about what happened. And, and I tried my best because I'll even say in here, you know, repeatedly, because when it comes to history, it, it's you're only limited to what resources you can find. Right. It's right so yeah. it, it's like, you know, because when I was interviewing one guy, he's like, well, I hope you get the town correct, because there's a lot of false stories out there. So you'll see in my book, a lot of times I'll say paranormal investigators claim. So I'm not saying that this is what I found out. You know, this is what others mm-hmm. claim to happen. <laughs> right. Because I'm so afraid to get the history wrong. <laughs> right. Sure. Sure. Of course. And but you can only go off of what other people say and what, have, what you have access to. I mean, you can dig for days, you know, months and years and still not find the truth. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions of ghost towns? Um, that all ghost towns are haunted, first okay. of all, because there's a chapter in the back that has all the other ghost towns listed that don't have paranormal activity. Oh, so, that's amazing. But, you know, and that all ghost towns were wild west savage like mm. because of of course you know nelson gold point got to that point a little bit but goldfield you know even today goldfield even though it's a functioning ghost town there's um probably a couple hundred residents that still are behind if there's even that many anymore and it still operates today um the uh county esmeralda county courthouse is there or the night, what the courthouse is there. I'm like drawing a blank. They're all building together now. And it, it's, it was the luxury of luxury, that particular town. It wasn't wild west. It wasn't all men like Nelson was. And it was just very interesting how these towns just aren't what people would think, you know, you don't, they're not what you expect. You would expect. Uh, Hollywood. Um, yeah. Hollywood usually portrays them like that. Right. Sure. Yeah. And and not all of them were, some of them were, but not, you know, not all of them. And and that's what I think a lot of people get wrong about these ghost towns is that, you know, or the, why would I want to go there? It's abandoned. Well, because the history. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. I like seeing the structures and, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm glad they're still standing and, Mm -hmm. you know, the wood doesn't deteriorate. I imagine the weather has something to do with that. I don't think those structures would survive in New England Mm -hmm. as well. A lot of them, <laughs> they look rather <laughs> loosely put together. They are. But, yeah. Hollywood would be the other factor besides, right. um, you know, mm-hmm. school history, right? That influences what people's perceptions are about these towns. Um, interesting that some of them weren't, weren't savage, that it was just normal, happy folk moving westward, trying to find yep. gold for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. And like the Bonnie Springs area was just basically a stopping point before, you know, and it was still a a stopping point that people went to before they tore it down. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Gail had asked, uh, what city in California? So what was the California side of Uh, that? Calico. Calico. Okay. All right. Yeah. So definitely more of these things than I I think the average person knows. Uh, Maybe if you're from that area, you, you may have a, a deeper insight to, you know, how, how much there are. I know I've seen some on TV that are sort of like, uh, museums in a way mm-hmm. like people stop in and they're able to yeah. tour the buildings and you know are any of these um that you talk about are, are they related to some of the places people like the public can go and and visit and get a yeah. tour of? nelson nevada is actually um el dorado canyon they um are it, the town is owned now by a couple that used to live in boulder city so okay. they've gone through, they've fixed the place up, and, and it's one of the most popular and most photographed places in the state. They have um, their sons do tours of the mine, and it, it's just a really, I, I love going there. It's actually, the, the cover was taken, was taken oh. there. Okay, very so, good. And, and it's just a really, really cute, fun town. Um, the owners have photos that date back who knows how far and they're they're more than happy to walk around the town with you and talk about it and they live there full time and just run the place then if you go to goldfield you can go to the I'm trying to think of well the goldfield emporium is still open and that's a cute little almost like a, just a quick mom and pop type shop to go into for souvenirs then the gold point or goldfield historical society does tours i know Goldfield High School was closed to the public unless you paid to do the paranormal tours at the in the night, but that is now up for sale. 
Okay. So I'm not sure. And Gold Point. Um, good retirement plan. Yeah. <laughs> Gold <laughs> Point's owned by three people, and they all monitor the town themselves, and they have the old mining cabins that you can stay in, you know, overnight, but you got to share an outhouse. There, there's no plumbing or anything like that to this town. And you get a TV with a VCR. That's how oh, wow. how back they are on it because there's no there's barely any enough electricity to run the town. And but you can stay there overnight. And that is supposed to be the best place in the state of Nevada because it's so dark to see the stars. Oh, um, beautiful. That, be gorgeous. Yeah, it must be really nice mm -hmm. in, in that regard. We really should take a road trip out there. I, I would love to see some of this. Are there towns that are like off the beaten path where you would have to like get in a pickup truck and drive off the main road through the desert to get to and sort of like an urban exploration type thing? There's several of those. A couple I've talked about in the book. I know um, Potosi, Mount Potosi, where Carol Lombard's plane and her plane is still there. Oh, wow. wow. The okay. plane crash is still there. Um, and Berlin is another one. You could still get there by a road, but it's just one road in, one road out. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, well, I'm trying to remember, there's a couple others that I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's several. And there's several that I didn't include in the book. The further you go north in Nevada, the more isolated the ghost towns are. Oh, that's interesting. And why, why is that? They were just abandoned and they didn't build other towns around them? I think so, because there's not as much. Most of the population is either in Reno, Carson City, or uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, Vegas, certainly. In those areas. But even I know when everybody knows, I, you know, when Vegas started, it was just in the middle of the desert, right? There was nothing right. there before. Right. Or seemingly... You know, and yep. it just built up over time. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So, uh, and your pre present day, besides doing this, um, have you been on other investigations uh, as of late? Not recently, because we've moved and just getting settled back here in Florida. And then I go actually a week from Monday, I go for my knee surgery. So I kind of really haven't started any projects until I get that done. Oh, oh, well, I, I hope that goes well. Yes. I've had a lot of pain in my own knee. I'm eventually yeah, going to have to get to the doctor and have them look at it so they can give me some kind of bad news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's never fun, right? You no, know, no. It's like we we're actually I was on a radio show last night and I was talking about how in Real Hunts Ghost Towns, there's a scene where we're climbing out of the mine in Nelson. Mm -hmm. And when the cameras weren't rolling, I was literally crawling. Uh, <laughs> out of the mind because I couldn't do it. And you could see, cause you could tell that something was going on because I was just covered. My black pants were covered in dirt. Uh, and it's once those cameras stopped rolling, I was like crawling my way out of that mine. Oh, and that, oh, that was like, okay, it's time to get my knees done. And March of 2021 is when I had my right knee done. They did a knee replacement on that knee last year. And now they're oh, doing it on the left knee. Wow. Does that one feel much better now that they did that? Yes, it, it took a while and it still is achy because they said it could take up to a year to a year and a half for a full recovery. Mm. But I definitely can notice the difference between the two knees now. Oh, good. Well, that's good. It's better. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we had another question from Lori Ann. She asked, uh, when you go to these ghost towns and investigations, do you ever have spirits follow you home? Um, I haven't, but I know some people have. I, I'm very peculiar, and the spirits know that. I, I go into these investigations fully protected. I have a pentacle that I wear. I have crystals in my pockets. You know, we, we go in fully protected, and um, we do the typical speech, you know, thank you for letting us visit with you. As long as you don't follow me home, we'll do our best to come back and see you in the future. <laughs> and, and basically the same thing too yeah and, and then my entire house is protected nothing nothing negative can get you know at least i don't think but i haven't had anything negative ever follow me home into the house i did have on an investigation when i was still living in vegas something followed me home mm -hmm. and when i got to the front door i closed the front door locked it did my typical routine took all my clothes off because this we we knew it was a uh, negative investigation to begin with so I wanted to make sure that I cleansed everything before going any further into my house. And I wasn't five feet away from the front door when it sounded like someone put their fist and punched the front door. Oh, really? Oh, my and, goodness. And when I looked out the peephole, I would have seen someone running away. And there was oh. nobody there. Nobody there. Mm -mm. Nobody and there. Uh, that is, that's really scary. Yeah. I, I, we would be. Yeah. Uh, 
So so something was mad. It couldn't get into my house. (laughs) Yeah. So you feel like those, those, um, protections that you put up in your house actually work. Now you have, are the co-founder and your bio mentions you're a co-founder of the Witches Paranormal Society. Mm-hmm. And you've got some cool moon shaped mirrors behind you that look yeah. uh, pretty witchy. Uh, we talk a lot about the science and then we have things like witchcraft and our psychic abilities to also play a role. So mm-hmm. where did that part of you come about and what steps do you take to do those sort of pre- protections? Well, it was, I want to say it was towards my, right about when I started high school. Um, I really, I was raised Roman Catholic, but when my grandmother passed, we ended up not really going to church that much anymore. So, and and I just didn't like the idea, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it, but I just didn't like the idea of being told you do something wrong. You're going to hell. It was Mm -hmm. black or white. No, no forgiveness, no nothing. It was, you know, and you have to do this. And I just didn't like the idea of the organized religion aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So I started researching and I picked and chose what worked for me. So I do a combination of green witchery and kitchen witchery because I love the earth, the crystals, and then the herbs and all of that stuff. So I kind of do what works for me. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, uh, Marissa, she founded Sin City Witches that I've been a part of for a long period of time. And then she came to me and she's like, you know what? We have a lot of people interested in the paranormal. Let's start this. (laughs) And, And it's we've started it and then it kind of fizzled out for a little bit and we started again. And it fizzled out, but we do have plans. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of stuff, including videos, um, training classes, and a whole bunch of other things um, coming up after my knee surgery. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And I like that okay. you're eclectic like that. Eclectic. We're, we're also eclectic. eclectic. And, and and we like those things as well and, and participate in, in them. Um, when you do a banishing or a protection of your, your house, for say, do you mm-hmm. use things like crystal grids? Or can you tell us how you do that or how you shake these spirits off if they do? I, I kind of do a combination. I do have um, four quartz crystals. And they're in the shape of a pentacle, the five points of the pentacle, with the top point facing north. Mm-hmm. And that's the first thing in any home I've moved into, the last thing of any home I move out of to leave. Then I also have um, herbal protection jars made with rosemary, thyme, and marjoram over all of our door frames. And nice. then around the perimeter, because like we have, we are in a townhouse now and we have a back patio. Around mm-hmm. the perimeter, I actually, this came from uh, Reverend Sean Whittington. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, he right. sent me some uh, blessed sea salt. It was a combination of white, black, pink, and red sea salt that he oh, blessed right. and sent to me. And that's sprinkled all around our back patio. Excellent. And if he hadn't sent that to me, I would have probably have done something similar myself anyway. <laughs> the salt for a long time has been thought of, you know, uh, as a barrier mm-hmm. between the, the living and the dead. And uh, yeah. things that are negative and keeping them on the outside, people put mm-hmm. salt on their windows. Yeah, so. and I didn't use it in this house, but you can also use cascaria okay. to bless okay. the different doors. What is that? I'm not mm-hmm. familiar with that. It, it's crushed eggshell. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yes. I think that may even have uh, like more voodoo roots or hoodoo roots. It, yeah, it's from voodoo backgrounds, but it's crushed eggshell and it's believed okay. to protect whatever is around it, just like it protects the yolk. And the baby chick as it grows. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. So I've never heard it called that though, but yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize it was called that. But um yeah, that's super. I, I like that you have this. What are sort of uh psychic things are you into and how how does that work? Um, psychically I don't really think I am, even though um, a lot of people say I am just because I can pick up on things that others can't, but it's not anything that I really really pushed pushed is for. It sort of- Thing where you get a feeling about something but you just think it's a feeling because you're the science part of your mind it, it, it could be, like you're kind of a left right brain fight it, it yeah. could be a combination of both um i know when i walk into investigations i can tell from the minute i step over the threshold oh this is going to be a good one or this isn't going to be a good one um i go places like if i'm at let's say disney world and in a big crowd of people i'll just start crying for no reason so, you know, I've been told that's the empath in me. Absolutely. And I can see spirits and hear spirits when others can't. But I always just thought that was part of being a paranormal investigator. Yeah. And that's an interesting yeah. topic in and itself. Talk Let, about, let's talk yeah. a little bit about that real mm-hmm. quick. And uh, certain people seem to get more data for some reason, you know, 
we don't want to say they got superpowers or, or magical abilities, but it, it seems tied into the sort of psychical mm -hmm. uh, phenomena. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you find that people on your teams like they're, they're like, oh, these people, they always, you know, seem to get something. Is it do you have people like that or do you get that feeling or? Yeah. Sometimes um, I do believe that there are psychics out there that do really good work. Um, but again, like with the paranormal field, there's too many out there that give it a bad name. And yeah. I think if it's done right, it works. But unfortunately, not everybody knows how to do it the right way. Like they overfeed their psychic with information before ever going on an investigation. You know, when I would bring one on an investigation, I don't even give them the address. I pick them up. Mm -hmm. You know, so that way there's no slight chance that they just got curious and Googled the address. Sure, sure. It, yeah. You know, so it's it's a whole bunch of different things. And I, it's not anything that I've really used because I like the more science base to it but it is interesting to see science line up with the psychic abilities absolutely that's like the best data right there mm -hmm. in remote viewing they call that front loading mm -hmm. right we're kind of giving the person who's going to do the viewing too much information or yeah. some clue something they could draw from a context and then of course their drawings may or appear that going in that direction right yeah so, yeah, very similar thing. Real quick, Lorianne Sweet said, what is blinking in your mirror? And I'm oh, going to okay. guess it's your um, ceiling fan. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice that. <laughs> yeah. I saw it when we first came on. I'm like, oh, that's different. That's good. <laughs> You know, it's fine. Yeah, but depending on what you're watching on, it may look like a ceiling fan or it might just look like a demon. We don't know. It, it's an orb. <laughs> it's an orb. Demon. Oh, everything. It's an orb. That's right. That's a, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. How about that? Thoughts on orbs? Ugh. Always a controversial yeah. subject. Exactly. If, if you don't, for me personally, just because there's so many, so many possibilities for the orb, unless you see it with your naked eye giving off its own light source, I don't even, I don't even bother. Yeah. No, yeah. How about when you talk to the line? It's not arguing. <laughs> right. I mean, there's so many dust orbs out there and moisture and it's, you know, amazing what people will, will say post in social media sometimes. But yeah, car lights are a thing. That's where, where I was going to go with the ghost lights. Yeah. The ghost lights is a kind of a different phenomena, yeah. but still mm -hmm. kind of under that orb co category. What do you think of uh, ghost lights? I, I think it's possible. You know, but like I had said earlier, it's similar to orbs. It would have to produce its own light. It can't be, it's not reflective. It would have to produce its own light. It would have to shine the light off of nearby surfaces in order for it to be, you know, authentic. And it's like we were in Vegas and some, one of our friends had shared a video that someone had made and put on YouTube and they were in the pathway from McCarran airport. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh my goodness, look at all those UFOs lined up and yeah. they're just hovering well, depending on where you're at in comparison to the airport, the lights do look like they're hovering. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Sure. I would imagine because you have a lot of flatlands, obviously, right? When right. you're out in the desert, you got all these long roads and, you you know, a, a plane would look, appear to be lower to the ground than people would expect. And yeah. of course, going if they're moving away from you or toward you, it would just appear to be hovering. Right. And we were just we were watching the video and I couldn't help but laugh. I'm like, you know, it's like we see that out of our you know bedroom window every night. You're right. Yes. <laughs> Take it for granted. But yeah, somebody yeah. else may look at that and go, oh my God, there it is. Yeah. Area yeah. 51. Uh, yeah. And it was in the direction of Area 51 where they were filming at. So uh, it was interesting. Have you had any uh, ufology related uh, data come across in your investigations or experiences? No, I haven't. No. Not yet. Not yet. I'm still Not trying. Yet. <laughs> still trying. Oh. Okay. Do you feel that the uh, fields are, are more related? Then yes. you know, people, oh, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Assume, I guess, would be the right word under I, the I, umbrella of paranormal, basically. But what about, um, let's see, interdimensional beings? I would say that that's definitely would that mm -hmm. be to you? It would be, and, and that falls under the shadow people. Okay, the shadow people could go from you know, is one of the theories for them, as well as the different aliens and Bigfoot for that matter, and, and yeah, cryptids. Bigfoot. You know, have you had any crypto uh, zool zoological encounters out there? Yeah, nope. I get that word out. Nothing, huh? No, we no, haven't had a lot of cryptids there. either. We're not big crypto people, but I, I have a bigger belief in them from other people at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, that they might exist. There might be stuff out there. And we're going to go footing soon. And we're going to go footing this summer, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Have you ever been footing? 
No, no, I, I don't like camping, so that's not that's not for me. So that one's out, right? Yeah, it's uh, out. Over and over. <laughs> yeah, well, bring lots of off. Yeah, I, I, I like hiking, but I got to be back at that Holiday Inn by nightfall. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, goodness. I like that. Yeah. We kind of feel the same way. We think, yeah. it's, you know, I, I don't want to discount it. You know, yeah. I think people are probably discovering something, you know, and its origins are, are kind of unknown, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, There's an argument, yeah. though, with that, though. Yeah. There's an argument yeah. that they're either interdimensional or they are some kind of, you know. Flesh and blood creature. Yes. That just, mm-hmm. you know, evades humanity. You know, but then they go, why didn't we find the dead ones? And as well, they take care of their dead or who who knows? We do discover new creatures all the time. Mm-hmm. But they're usually things like weird crabs in the bottom of the ocean. Right. See, not, not a not a Bigfoot looking into your window <laughs> coming, coming through your backyard. And, but, and as big as they are, why haven't we seen them before? Yeah. When I was them yeah. as often as often you know. as it. Yeah, it, it's tough. We live in this age where we have such good technology that like really? UFOs, Bigfoot, big feet or whatever can be um you know faked so easily and uh, mm-hmm. and my youtube feed is filled with all kinds of fake stuff I, yeah. I hate to say it i'm sorry i watch some of this paranormal stuff on there and oh. it's just like way too much activity and it, they're like putting together mini horror movies and filing yeah. it under you know yeah this really happened in an investigation and you know mm-hmm. it did right <laughs> yeah. you know for how do you discern like what do you do yourself like to discern you know the uh, what, for lack of a better word, what's bullshit from right. from reality? It, it's a tough call because it's one of those things where, you know, it is possible to get a full body apparition because mm-hmm. we, we have one that we captured in Goldfield. But if you have to zoom in and do too much editing to the photo, it, it's not there. You know, but yeah. then also if you zoom in, when you're analyzing it, I, the first thing I do is I check the EXIF information, first of all. And if that's missing, I tell them, you know, I need the original photograph or I'm not going to go any further because it's not worth my time. Because that tells you if it's been altered, what camera was used, what the what you know data was taken on and all of that information. And then uh, we'll zoom in on the photo where the you know entity supposedly is. Mm-hmm. And nine times out of 10, when someone sends me a photo, you can... Once you're zoomed in, you can tell the pixels go in a different direction where the entity that they say is there. And uh-huh. that's that's a dead giveaway. It's It's been altered. It's right. been Photoshopped or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we see a, a lot of that. Yeah. Like, yeah I, I, we watch entire videos. Like, not yeah. with name, names, but just yeah, we're, like, no. really? <laughs> you know, and yeah. you can almost see the fishing line on the cabinet, you know, <laughs> pulling the cabinet doors open. Yeah. Like uh, the Paranormal Activity movie, which is it amazing. Just, you know, it's kind of like the rock that went flying at the Goldfield Hotel, and I'm not going to name names of what team did that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, I think I saw that. And, but it made know, it onto a major TV show. <laughs> yeah, it was like yeah. a rock or brick or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think so, too. And, Laurie Ann yeah. Sweet says, uh, or flesh and blood, going back to the Bigfoot mm-hmm. creature that manipulates the portals between the dimensions. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what it does and has. The ability to do that, like, Mm -hmm. you know, um, ghosts or spirits, you know, seemingly do or some of these other entities, you know, whatever label we want to give them. You know, what do you think about those labels? Everybody likes that D word, right? (laughs) Speaking of that, that rock flying. Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) And do you feel like it's overused? Do you think some of these things might be aliens, angels or the actual D word? It, it, it's way overused because in all the years that I've been researching and even with working with the Warren Foundation, I've never come across, you know, anything that was demonic. And, you know, and we did have one that our other team members before I started the team I have right now, they were all like, oh, it's a demon. We need to go in there. We need to do X, Y and Z. So we went in there thinking it was demonic when it was just an asshole human. Sorry for my language. No, but, you're that, welcome to do that. That's essentially what it was. It was just he was a jerk in life and he was a jerk in the afterlife. Just but so it wasn't that. a demon. <laughs> so, that's what a lot of and that's people, what a lot of pe- people attribute uh, the D word to. Right. The demon to. Yeah. 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 If time. something negative happens, it's a demon and it's not. Yeah, it's, it's just bad luck. You know, or a spirit trying to get your attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. A yeah, lot of people like say said, that your your personality may carry over into exactly. the afterlife. 
And if you're an asshole here, you're going to be an asshole there. Yep. But maybe yep. you've got some superpowers now and, you know, you're not always seen. They're kind of like the Invisible Man's. Right. <laughs> the fly on the wall. <laughs> right, right, right. That's that's very interesting. Um, I noticed in, in the front of this, we were talking about spirit boxes. Are, are you skeptical of a spirit box data because of the ability to, you know, get a lot of uh, apophenia? Yes and no. Um, I do use them. I have them, but I won't use them for a residential investigation because it's not true evidence of a paranormal haunting because like with orbs, there's too many possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I have used them, especially when we do, you know, like filming for the TV shows and the documentaries. And then when you host an event, you know, it's real hard to explain to people, you know, Hey, use your digital voice recorder and you'll get your evidence when you get home after you've paid a hundred dollars to attend this event. Mm, you, you can't sure. do that. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and we've used them at the different events that we have hosted or that we've participated in. And we've actually gotten some really good evidence on it, but it just, it's not evidence that could be used to back up anything for a residential. It's like you want other stuff too. You know, I guess I think a lot of teams and it's happened to us as well. We start to focus on it because we've had, you know, such good data from them. But, you know, we also know that there's this, you know, the elephant in the room is, hey, of course, there's going to be words and noise. And you know what I mean? It is radio stations. Right. And we try to work around that. But, you know, we feel like a lot of it um, that, you know, as multi-syllabic and we form sentences and we get into that and our highly relevant answers that are very clear uh, gives us more validation for its use. And I like it. I think one of the things that we one of the theories we postulate around is that they use these sort of things as like a palette, you know, to communicate. And it seems to be harder if there's nothing there. Uh, you know, we would rather have a, you know, class A EVP than a good spirit right. box session. Of yep. course. But they're harder to get. And then I imagine from the spirit point of view, it must be harder to do. I mean, I think mm-hmm. that sometimes they use things like our breath to create the EVPs. And that's probably why there are so many whispery ones, you know, mm-hmm. like, but it's clearly a word. Like, where did that noise come from? I've heard uh, we've captured some data where we there were things in the environment like birds that seem to make part of the oh, yes. communications that they were trying to do. Yep. So it's almost like a painter's palette is how I think of it. Right. You know, yep. that they, they'll use it. But like, like you said, there are radio stations, there are things, there are car ads flying through, you know, and that, that sort of thing. That's really not going to be. The thing relevant, I like you know? about it though, when we do get um, good information is when um, you ask them something and it repeats. Mm-hmm. Like I had this and like, we were at my house one night and somebody ran their fingers through my hair. And I said, who ran their fingers through my hair? And you hear five or six Pauls did it first said, not me. And then, and it was on this box. And then it said, Paul, 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 a different voices. They keep hearing the name, come back, the same name, right. Without anything really in between it, just Paul. Right. Paul. So it's, so it's those kinds of those examples like that we, the good know. data. Yeah. So, like the itc but at yep. the same time really totally also agree with 100 percent that it's yes. it's not infallible and right you know simply, i don't know you yeah. no we, we're actually i have um it was an old mob hangout it used to be a, a very popular bar and um the the boss wanted us to take their employees around on a tour so that way they wouldn't be afraid of the spirits that were there because there were, there was tons of act i mean one of the most haunted locations on the vegas strip Wow. And so we were taking them around and I had a group with me and they were, they loved the spirit box. They just absolutely loved it. And so we were using it throughout most of the investigation. And all of a sudden something grabbed my butt, which is what would have happened, <laughs> you know, in a mobster bar. Right. And I was like, who just grabbed my butt? And you get, I did, he did. <laughs> there you go. There you go. On the spirit box. And it was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because now you've got the two things mm-hmm. and they yeah. do like to grab butts that's happened to her mm-hmm. that has not I happened to me times no one has grabbed my butt Paranormal. but it was just weird i was backed up against a wall and it literally it was like <laughs> there's nobody behind me <laughs> yep that's i don't know so I, I personally I, I guess i don't have enough to grab they just yes, they don't do. bother quiet <laughs> don't get me started <laughs> that is funny do you, do you have you found that that's a um a common thing a lot of people do talk about being kind of groped and mm-hmm. that's 
on on investigation. So you find that some of these ghosts are a little dirtier. They're trying to get a reaction from from the people, or I don't know. What what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's you know again goes to with what they were like in life, what they were used to in life, um, and you know they could be bored. I, I really think I do believe that some ghosts do have a good sense of humor, mm-hmm. and, and I think a lot of things that they do is to screw with us. <laughs> right. Get a reaction. I mean, what else are you going to do in the afterlife? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think about the idea that of, you know, the people talk where the afterlife go into the light, and yet they have these earthbound spirits that seem to haunt mm-hmm. us. Do you do you ascribe to those those hypotheses of, as well? Do you think some just they go to a heaven or whatever we want to call it? Um, we don't need a religious label, just some light, whatever. Uh, and some are just for whatever reason, maybe, are we're tormented or scared to go cross over, stay here and and mess with the living it's a whole bunch of different things i mean again we have free will in the afterlife so why are we going to stick around in one location so do they really stick around in one location do they travel to different locations and you know do they even stay on earth you know are there different you know demand do we go to another dimension or can we you know can we without our physical bodies are we able to transport between these dimensions a lot easier yeah, yeah, that's what I think mm-hmm. uh, is is going on with it. I think there's just it opens up things. Uh, I don't know if you've had any experience with astral projection mm-hmm. or like uh, lucid dreaming, where yeah. you know you're very aware of, of what's going on, and it really anything you think of is possible. Mm-hmm. There, there seems to be no time, you know, and that's that's the thing, right? Yeah, people talk about with with the spirit world. Maybe there's no time on that side, mm-hmm. right? You know, that's a, a man made concept. This linear time, right? Oh, this has been fascinating. So yes. tell us when the, when the book is coming out again and uh, how people, where should people go to see it and find you? Okay, it is uh, Haunted Southern Nevada Ghost Towns. It's coming out August 22nd and it's from History Press. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, and you can also go to your local bookstore to pre-order it. I know a couple people who have gone to their local bookstores and pre-ordered it. And then you can find me at Dr. Heather Lee on Facebook or Exploration Paranormal. And um, a lot of events coming up. We are planning an event. Um, we will be, I, well, I know Chris McKinnell will be joining me along with Bill Slevin from the Warren Foundation. We'll be at Phantasm here in Orlando at the end of August. As long as my knee is working and cooperating, I'll be there as well. And then Chris and I are going to be hosting an event uh, with Flumery Promotions in September up in Virginia Beach. Oh, nice. That's great. That's great. And I've got your explanation. I mm-hmm. uh, can't talk. Yeah, that's great. Just be a podcaster and not be able to talk. <laughs> Exploration <laughs> Paranormal Site Up, which is a very cool site. I was checking yep. that out. And that website, we are in the process of updating it. Um, we'll be adding to the blog as well as I'm going to be having a events tab that we'll be adding because um, I am partnering with Flumery Promotions to do events, not just for the Warren Legacy Foundation, but I'm partnering with Ray, who's the founder of that company, to do other events with his other uh, uh people he represents such as Brandon Alvis and Mustafa and Daryl and Chelsea and all those guys. That's nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. Congratulations on the new book. And uh, it sounds like you've got a lot of great stuff coming down the pike. We definitely look forward to it. We love your show. Uh, When is ghost education 101 on and when is the Warren files on? We are both are on a break right now until I get back from my knee surgery. We were taking a break in August anyway, because that's our break time. But we are, I know, on August 3rd, I think. Yeah, August 3rd, Philip's going to be hosting Lloyd Arbach for a presentation. And then after that, we won't be returning until the Warren Files comes back on September 7th. And then Ghost Education 101 will be back the opposite week. Great. Awesome. Well, we look forward to that. Yes, and we'll be um, privately messaging you and make sure you're you're doing okay after your right. surgery. So, Thank you. We've enjoyed Welcome. it. Stick around. We're yes. just going to wrap things right up and we'll be right with you. All right. So, uh, hey, folks, uh, have a great week. Um, I know our schedule uh, ourselves has been a little erratic. We're mm-hmm. working on some projects and things are slowly and I mean slowly moving along. But yes. you got to keep at it or it just goes away. Right. <laughs> so um, we will be back, I believe, next Thursday. Uh, I believe we have Dr. Michael Lynch on uh, for the Dark Horse Paranormal podcast. And uh, we will see you guys then. Bob. And hey, hey, Bob Burnell, how are you doing? And thank you, everybody. Lorianne, yes. thank you for your questions. Gail, Robert Honings, um, uh, Kimmy, everybody that joined today. Irene Takura, 
Uh, nice to see you again. Debbie, and Debbie Wallace Hagen. You guys have a great weekend. Enjoy yourselves, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.